Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Casares. Uh, Sebastian is a young, accomplished birder, and he actually just finished high school. Like he just got his, uh, his ceremony um, just last month. So congratulations, Sebastian. Um, Sebastian's love for birds started when he was just seven years old. And since he was the only person in his family interested in birds at the time, he taught himself about birds by reading field guides and birding in his yard. As he gained support from his family to nurture his love for birds, Sebastian began helping lead bird walks and giving presentations about birds when he was just nine years old. And he has been recognized for his bird education efforts. In 2015, at the age of 12, he was the first child to ever win an award from the Children in Nature Collaborative in Austin. This is actually around the time that I first met Sebastian, and his knowledge about birds was truly impressive, and his passion was infectious. He is known to do great impressions of some bird calls, and I think he might do some tonight, so something to look forward to for sure. And in 2017, Sebastian started the Texas Blue Jay Project to encourage Texans to explore birds in their backyards, cities, and state parks. And in 2018, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center recognized Sebastian as their first young avian advocate in their wildfire magazine. So he has continued to give talks and engage the community with birds, and I'm so excited to see what the future holds for him. So Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us, and I'll have you take it away. So thank you, Serena. It's always great to see you. Before I get started, I'd like to take my, give my sympathies to those affected by the California wildfires. My prayers and thoughts go out to you all. So I would like to thank San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory and Latino Outdoors for co-partnering with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. I'm excited to take you through a memory lane of how I got started into birding and how I shared my love for birds to my community. So since I was young, I was always drawn to nature and attracted to flying things like planes, birds, and especially blue jays. My love for birds started at the age of seven with an Audubon book and the blue jay that was constantly in my backyard. My eyes were mesmerized of the beauty of the blue jay, and I wanted to know more about blue jays and the other birds around me. I would sit for hours outside in my backyard studying the blue jay's behavior and their calls. I remembered one day when I was seven years old, my mom and I went to the bookstore, and I came across this huge Audubon bird book. And here's a picture of the actual book right here. I still have this book after all, all these years. I was drawn to the beautiful bird photos in this book, and I found it amazing how many birds there were in the world. I knew I had to get this book. I wanted to read more about these magnificent birds. So I asked my mom if she could buy me the book. She looked at the price of the book and told me that it was too expensive to buy and to put the book back where I got it from. Luckily for me, there was a long line at the registers, and it gave me plenty of time to convince my mom to buy me the book. Eventually, she caved in and bought me the book after all. Once I got in the car, I could not stop reading it. I studied the book day and night. I was so preoccupied with reading it that my mom would catch me reading the book late at night when I was supposed to be sleeping. My mom wasn't aware that I had memorized this huge bird book in less than a month. She found out when I had taken a science class at Austin Nature Science Center, it was a class about birds. My teacher, Miss Ginny, was astounded of how I knew so much about birds during a bird activity we were doing in class that after class, Miss Ginny spoke to my mom about my birding potential and she believed that I can become an excellent birder and to encourage me more into birds and birding. My parents were not birders. They didn't know anything about birds. All they could identify was a male cardinal and a grackle and that was about it. I also didn't have any relatives or friends that, were, that knew about birds or bird watching. My mom didn't know where to begin to help nourish my interest in birding, so I ended up teaching myself about birds 
and bird watching by reading several bird books. My mom would take me to several city parks to practice my birding skills. I would take notes on their bird behaviors and songs because at the time I didn't own binoculars, I would also study the bird flights and their several calls. The following year, I took another science class at Austin Nature Science Center with Miss Ginny. This class was about nature sounds. One CD she played was about bird songs and she asked the class if you can recognize any of the bird songs that played. I eagerly raised my hand and was able to identify all the bird sounds that she played. Miss Ginny was impressed how I was able to identify all the bird calls and even make some of them as well, that she spoke to my mom again after class about encouraging me into birding. She handed my mom a flyer for a Celebrate Urban Birds event that they were planning to have. My mom said if my dad wasn't working that Saturday, we can go. I was excited that my dad was off from work that day and we were able to attend. At the Celebrate Urban Birds event, there were lots of bird activity tables and bird walks. The bird guide that led my first bird walk was astounded how much I knew about birds and ID them as well, that she invited my family and I to attend their Audubon meetings and bird walks. I never knew that there were birding groups in our community. I couldn't wait to attend them. I am very grateful for Miss Ginny for her support in my early birding and especially for giving my mom a Celebrate Urban Birds flyer. Attending the Celebrate Urban Birds event had changed my life. I would have never guessed that I would become a co-leader for a Celebrate Urban Birds bird walk that following year at the age of nine. Now that I had read lots of bird field guide books, I was anxious to get outdoors to find and see all these beautiful birds. My parents purchased for me a $10 binocular set and I couldn't see birds well in them, so I ended up not using them. I instead used my eyes and my ears to bird. I studied the birds' flying patterns and their sounds they made, and I took lots of notes. I would also try to study the difference between certain look-alike species that are very common, like the morning dove and the white-winged doves, which white-winged doves almost similar to, in appearance to our familiar morning doves, except for the white-winged doves, a little bit bigger, chunkier, and if you actually see the wings, they have bold white wing patches on the wings, whereas the morning doves are a little bit smaller and slimmer, and they don't have any white on the wings. Instead, they have like little dark spots on the wings. And if you look at the tails, the white winged doves have a short squared shaped tail with white tail tips. Whereas the morning doves have a long pointed tail. And the morning doves, they make the call, which you're probably familiar with this bird in your backyard or your city parks that you go to, which you'll hear the morning doves make their cooing sound that sounds like this. And then the white-winged doves, they instead make a different call. It sounds more like they're saying, who cooks for you? Where it's like, <laughs> and they also make a different flight call because ever walked around an area where you saw a morning dove and then it gets flushed and you hear it make a wing whistle? The morning dove's wing whistle kind of sounds like this. And then the white-winged doves make almost a similar sound, but it's set for, it's a more of a shorter, softer, more muffled sound, where it's more like <laughs> When my parents finally bought me a decent pair of binoculars, it took me about a whole year to get used to using those binoculars. But once I did, watch out, my binoculars were glued to my hands. I was so anxious and ready to use my binoculars to try to find as many birds as I can. I started studying all the bird families, like the Caprimogidae, which are the night jars, which as you see in the top left here, this is a common nighthawk. A familiar bird you'll see throughout the United States during the summer. Usually you'll find them around the evenings hovering almost bat-like over fields, making their loud calls that sound like this. Me, me. 
Beep, beep. And then there's another nightjar called the common poor well, which is almost similar in appearance to the nighthawk, except for it's a little bit smaller and bulkier in shape. And the poor well's a grayish brown color, and it's commonly found out in the west. They have a rounded wings and a short tail. And usually if you were to find a poor well, they'll usually be usually found in the side of the roads, especially at nighttime, as you'll see them sitting there because in the nighttime, a lot of moths and insects that they eat will fly around that area. And then there, the, if the moth flies directly above the common poor well, it will literally jump up from the air, open its big wide mouth and swallow the bug whole. And the common poor wells, the poor wells get their name because of the call they make, which kind of sounds like they're saying poor will, where it sounds like And if you're actually at a really close range within the bird when it's calling, you might hear a third syllable in, among the call, like a weep call, where it sounds like The common poor will is another, is another special thing about this bird is that this is actually one of the only bird to hibernate. Because you think of hibernation, you think of that's what bears, skunks, and mammals do, but you wouldn't think a bird can hibernate. But the poor wills do. Literally, they go through a short-term hibernation period called torpor, which literally their bodies will shut down and freeze, as you'll see them hide behind a rock crevice and stay sleeping. You might think it's dead, but it's actually still alive. And then when it's springtime and it warms up, the birds get active again. So if you were to see a, a poor will or any nightjar just sitting on the ground, don't automatically think it's dead. Just leave the bird alone because it's just resting. And then there's the passeriformes, which are the passerines or perching birds, which are majority all of our songbirds. So a few examples of songbirds would be like the warblers, the sparrows, grackles, blackbirds and cardinals. And then there's the strigidae, which are the owls, as you can see our familiar barn owl right here. And then there's some owls that you, that are found in North America that probably you're not so familiar with. Like in the Western United States, in mountainous regions, you might find a small tiny owl called the Northern Pygmy Owl. It's so small that it's really almost the same size as a sparrow. These little owls are tiny. They're only about seven inches. The Northern Pygmy Owls, small grayish brown owl with bright yellow eyes, yellow bill, long tail, and it has no ear tufts. And an interesting feature about Pygmy Owls is if you see them turn the back of their neck, they have two black spots on the back of the neck, which creates kind of a false face which what this does is because of the bird's small size, it can easily be preyed upon by several predators like hawks, cats, and even other owls. So they use those dark spots. So if the predator tries to sneak up from them on behind, from behind, then they'll realize that the owl has no behind. So they'll know to leave it alone because these owls are very quick and agile and they can easily get away. But pygmy owls are pretty fierce predators themselves too, where they have the ability, despite being a sparrow-sized bird, they can catch birds and mammals twice the size of themselves because they can sometimes catch birds up to the size of morning doves and even quail, and they can even grab mammals like chipmunks, ground squirrels, and even actual squirrels. So these little owls are very amazing, and they make a series of whistling toots that sound like this. And then also around California, you're blessed to have a special owl that's endangered called the spotted owl. It's one of our rarest owl species in North America. It's a medium sized to large sized brown owl. It has a big round head with no ear tufts, brown eyes, bright yellow bill, and they have brown and white speckles on the chest and white spots on the back. Closely related to their eastern cousin, the barred owl, which is almost similar, but the barred owls are slightly larger and they're more of a grayish brown color overall. And they have vertical streaks on the belly instead of spots. But the two, but the features they share is that they have the big round heads with no ear tufts, and then they have the brown eyes and the bright yellow bill. 
The spotted owl makes a different call. It sounds like this. Whereas the barred owl makes the call sounds like this. And then in the northwestern United States, it's very rare, but sometimes where barred owls and spotted owls overlap in range, they might create hybrids or interbreeds called sparred owls, which are really like intermediate in plumage to both species and their calls are intermediate. But it's very rarely seen in the wild because these two species don't really interact too much. And then there's the Acipridae, which are the raptors, like the hawks, eagles, kites, and allies. So I started paying attention towards all the birds in my area, and I created a life list. A life list is a list that birders make to keep track of all the birds they have seen in their entire lives, and also in a particular year as well, which in that case, it would be known as a year list. A year list, how this works is, Say you start the new year in January 1st of 2021 and you're in your backyard in California and then the first bird you see at your feeder is a Stellar's Jay, which that'd be really cool. If you were to see this bird and this was your first time seeing it for the year, then that will count as the first species you see for the year. And then if you were to see another bird, like a morning dove, come to your feeder, then, and that's your first time seeing it, then that counts as another species. But if you've already seen it already for the year, then that's already doesn't that's already seen in the first day of the year. So once I documented the birds in my area, I started to document the birds in other regions of Texas. I was amazed how many different types of birds we get here in Texas, especially the migrants, like the beautiful painted buntings and the journey the painted buntings make, which the painted buntings of birds are probably not familiar with in California, because they're very rare, there are only a few rep reports of them. The painted bunting's a very colorful bird. As you see, the males have a dark blue head, green back, and a bright red belly, whereas the females are more of an olive green color. The painted bunting immature males kind of almost look similar to the females, but one thing about painted buntings is only the males would sing, not the females. So usually if you're in a Texas hill country, during the spring or summer, and you see like a little shrub in open field with a tree on the top, you might see the brightly colored male painted buntings perched on top of those trees, singing their hearts out, making warbling whistles that sound like this. And then painted buntings, they spend the, the winter in Mexico and Central America, and then they spend the summer here in the United States. And it's always a treat to see these very beautiful birds here in North America. When I started bird watching, I struggled with some birding identification skills. It was different from reading a bird field guide book to identifying birds outdoors. Birds love to move a lot. It, I was eight years old when I attended my first Audubon bird walk. And I was shocked to be that I was the only young person there. In this picture, my first Audubon bird walk, I'm pretty sure you can locate my parents and I. All the bird walks and the bird group meetings I would attend were majority older adults and senior citizens. It lacked diversity. My parents continued taking me to a few more bird walks. They did it because I wanted to attend them to learn more and to practice my birding ID skills. They would also take me to the Audubon monthly meetings. I remember looking forward to every third Thursday of every month to attend these meetings. Even though I was the only child attending these meetings, I still found these bird talks fascinating and educational. I learned so much. Now looking back at my first Audubon bird walk photo, you can see how I wanted to see the birds that they were looking at but no one seemed to care to invite me to view the birds in their scope. Sometimes birders get too caught up with the birds and forget to share them. There needs to be a more welcoming and inclusiveness into the birding community. Nature is meant to be shared and enjoyed with everyone. I would have never imagined that this introduction into the birding community would make a big impact in my life. That the older I got, I would be giving bird talks for bird groups and leading several bird walks for birders and for my community. When I was nine years old, I became 
the Travis Audubon Society volunteer, sharing my birding knowledge to others. I started volunteering at the Purple Martin parties, educating my community about Purple Martins and their fascinating migration. I would also help out at several Travis Audubon events, working at their bird activity tables. I would participate in yearly birdathons and lead bird walks. I noticed while volunteering at these events, I hardly would see any children there, especially at the bird walks. So my mom and I decided to speak to the director of the Travis Audubon Society so we can start the Travis Audubon Society Young Birders Club. In the Travis Audubon Society Young Birders Club, I would present monthly bird talks and bird walks for families. My mom would create bird art crafts for the families for every meeting. At each bird talk meeting, I would have different bird topics, like for example, the waterfowl in our area. Afterwards, I would take them for a bird walk to try to find all the waterfowl we had learned about. I would create bird checklists for the most common birds found in the area. We held our Young Birders Club meetings at several city parks around town to learn more about the different types of birds they can find in different habitats. Once in a while, we'll have a special guest come over, like a biologist, to speak to the group about the endangered golden cheek warbler, a very special bird we get here in Texas, as it breeds and nests exclusively in central Texas and then winters in Mexico. It's a very colorful bird. It's a black and white bird with bright golden yellow cheeks and a black eye line with a whitish belly and a black throat. The females are almost similar, but duller than the males. Then the biologist will come speak about insects, trees, and other nature-related topics. My mom would create these bird activities for the Young Birders Club meetings. For instance, on a Thanksgiving event, she created turkey art crafts. And I remember the kids really enjoyed making a turkey collar. It had uneven lengths of straws and artificial feathers. You would blow into it and it would make the alarm call of a turkey. The Young Birders Club started from humble beginnings. In 2015, we had only six members, and in 2017, it grew to up to 45 members and growing. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I, the more I got involved with teaching the community about birds and bird watching, I noticed the lack of diversity in birding. So I did some research and I found these interesting articles. The first one in 2011 says, that 93% of American birders were white, 5% were Hispanic, 4% were black, 1% were Asian American, and 2% were other. And then the second one that I found says, the Audubon's market research has identified 9 million people between the ages of 18 and 35 who share a blend of an interest in birds and environmentalism. 25% are Hispanic, 18% are African American and 10% are Asian American. I found it important to advocate for the need of more minorities into birding. I was honored to be part of a guest speaker panel for the National Parks and Recreation Association in 2017 to speak on behalf of the importance of Latino birders. This motivated me and inspired me to start the Texas Blue Jay Project. As I mentioned before, I had to teach myself about birds at a very young age. When I got into high school, I needed to expand my knowledge in ornithology, something I would like to major in college. So I asked fellow Texas birders if anyone would be interested in mentoring me. And I was blessed to have Dr. Keith Arnold, Professor Emeris from Texas A&M University to share his time and knowledge in mentoring me. I learned so much from him about becoming an ornithologist, and I improved so much in my birding knowledge. I realized the importance of mentorship to young birders that I wanted to become a birding mentor to my community. I would go teach homeschool and public school students about the world of birds and careers in birding. In early 2017, I decided to leave the Travis Audubon Society Young Birders Club to start the Texas Blue Jay Project. 
My goal was to reach out to Texans that have never noticed birds or never knew about birds and bird watching in their backyards. I understand that a lot of adults and kids will not want to wake up early, extremely early to attend a bird walk, especially drive across town to learn about birds. When I created the Texas Blue Jay Project, I wanted to bring birding to them at their schools, libraries, and city parks. I started the bird walks later at 8.30 a.m. instead of 7 a.m. to bring in more families to come. The Texas Blue Jay Project mission is to encourage and educate Texans to explore birds and bird watching in their backyards, city, and state parks. So I started spreading the word of birding throughout the state of Texas in rural and urban areas. In my bird talks, I would educate people about their local birds in their area so they can become familiar and aware of the birds. I would make bird calls during the bird presentations to help them get familiar with the sounds of their backyard birds. I would search throughout Texas where there was a need to introduce birding. I remembered when I was birding at a city lake park nearby, I was constantly being asked by resident walkers if I knew what birds they were looking at. There was such a need to teach the residents there of all the beautiful birds they get there, especially the migrants. So I decided to take the initiative and to bring the Texas Blue Jay Project to them. I planned a birding event with the city to give a bird talk about all the birds they get there at their lake. We also had several bird art activity tables and a bird book door prize drawing. I was happy it was a huge success. We had around 100 people show up. It was rewarding for me to see all these residents get excited about the birds they have at their lake, and now they can identify the birds they are seeing. I was determined to, to continue the mission of the Texas Blue Jay Project to encourage Texans to explore birds and bird watching. So I made an effort to have the Texas Blue Jay Project at several community events, especially school events. It was important to teach adults and kids how to identify local backyard birds and how to use binoculars. It is our responsibility as stewards of the planet to know the names of our local birds and to care for them and their habitats. I made sure I held bird walks for the community to show them and introduce them to the beauty of birds around them. The majority of the people who attended the bird walks, this was their first time ever attending a bird walk. It was special for me to have been a part of their first birding experience. When the Texas Blue Jay Project would host a birding table at community events, I would have bird ID games and arts and crafts like a bird face mask or a binocular table teaching them how to use binoculars. I also distributed bird field guide books. I would also make bird calls for the kids so they can learn how to make them too. And sometimes, I would bring my puppet, Booble, a great horn owl for the kids. At every Texas Blue Jay Project event, I would have a Texas Blue Jay Project pledge sign-up sheet for Texans to sign and pledge. This pledge was about pledging to explore birds and bird watching in their backyards, city, and state parks. I was able to collect over 2,500 signatures from 2017 to 2019. In 2018, I got the idea to start collecting used bird field guidebooks for schools and low income students in my community. These bird books can help the school start up a young birders club and help low income students who will not have the finances to afford a bird field guidebook. I thought to myself, what a great way to recycle used bird field guidebooks by asking fellow Texas birders to donate their used and outdated bird field guidebooks that they don't use anymore to the Texas Blue Jay Project bird book drive. The Texas Blue Jay Project held several bird book drives at several community libraries. We were able to collect 200 used bird books for schools and for the community. I started the Texas Blue Jay Project blog to teach about the several types of birds we get in Texas and to promote upcoming events. 
My email's at the bottom of the screen for anyone interested in having me as a guest speaker at their event. I give bird presentations on several bird topics like owls, backyard birds, and bird migrants. I also perform bird calls. I can make over 100 bird calls. Now bird is the word. I would have never imagined that sharing my love for birds to my community that it would bring so much attention. In 2015, I was honored to become the first child to ever win a Children in Nature Collaboration of Austin E. Lee Walker Award. I was also invited to present bird talks and bird call performances at several Texas birding festivals. I was also interviewed by a local TV station about the Texas Blue Jay Project, and I also wrote a blog story for American Birding Association about the Texas Blue Jay Project and the importance of mentorship. I was honored to be recognized in 2018 by the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center to be their first avian advocate for bringing birding awareness to the community. One thing when I teach people about birding, I always like to remind people to enjoy the birds and not to get too caught up with extreme birding. And yes, there are a few birders that are like the characters in the book, The Big Year, that go to the extreme to go see a bird. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some birds that are worth chasing. For example, when there was a snowy owl reported in Texas, I knew I could not miss out an opportunity to go see this beautiful bird. Now, all the birding experiences from seven years old to present, the best memories that I have is sharing the love of birds to others. This is the true meaning of the joy of birding. I recalled one time I had given a bird talk at my hometown library and I talked about backyard birds to a group of families. Afterwards, I received the message later on that day from a mom that her six-year-old son was screaming with joy all throughout their house because he had saw a male Northern Cardinal in his backyard, a bird he had learned at the bird talk I had given. This is why I do it to bring joy and smiles to people just like how birds did to me. Thank you for listening to this talk and I hope it inspires you to share the joy of birding. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Sebastian. That was fantastic. Uh, the first question that I see is from Maureen who asks, are you starting college this fall? Yes, I'm starting college this fall at Temple College. I actually started it last month. Yeah, and that's a, they're a community college, right? Yes, it's a community college. Yeah, and it's all distance learning right now. Yes. Yeah. Carla asks, uh, Sebastian, how many birds do you have on your life list? Oh, my life list. I have around... 430 species in my total for so far my total life list. Nice, that's a good number. Um, and uh, Marilyn asks, uh, what are your educational and life goals? Well, what I'm supposed to do, I'm trying to educate the community so they can be aware of the birds and to like explore the birds because there's so many times that all these beautiful birds have been ignored by several people and I just want to let people know that about all these beautiful birds that are around them and this whole ex new world that's in front of them that they're not seeing. So I'm hoping to educate and to spread birding to more people. Yeah, and you're also hoping to, you're, you're hoping to study birds too, right? I know yes. that you've gotten involved in some, uh, some local research projects as well. Um, Jan asked, have you had many opportunities to bird outside of Texas? Well, it's, starting in 2018, my parents and I went to Colorado. We visit the state of Colorado. And then actually most recently, Last year, we visit the, visited the states of the Dakotas, both north and south, and was amazed of the different environments there and the birds there. And we did a trip to Louisiana. So far, we're, we're planning to do a trip in, for California next year, 
when everything gets better. Yeah. I'm sure there are lots of people here who would love to, you know, help host a bird walk for you or something. Um, that would be awesome. Um, so uh, we have an anonymous question. Um, this person lives in rural Oregon and would love to start a diversity focused birding project for youth. Do you have any advice for finding youth that can be leaders like yourself? Well, my advice is to just usually for to attract more minorities into birding and to nature is by educating them about the, the birds and nature around them. So by doing more outdoor activities and in nature related events, that's how you might encourage more minorities into the nature. Yeah, so maybe having those opportunities available um, can, you know, start to spark that interest in younger birders and then hopefully that can get them started at least. Um, so let's see, our next question is, uh, what advice would you give to young birders? I say to just, if, you, if you're a young birder and you're, in, and you're still into birding, I encourage you to pursue that that passion for birds because that's what I did when I was younger. I encourage everyone to pursue the love of birds and to never give up when it seems difficult. Um, let's see and Gina asked is there an app that you recommend to identify birds and keep a life list? Well usually there's eBird which does some identifications that helps you identify certain birds in the, the contacts that usually if you log, if you try to look f up all the birds in the McCallulary library, they'll show you pictures and facts about the birds. And that's actually an area where you can log in birds that you see around your backyard or your city or state parks. And you can actually keep a life list on eBird, which there's a special section called My Life List and that's where you'll get to see all the birds that you've posted for your entire life. And they'll also split it down for the years as well. For birding identification, there's a couple of apps. Like there's the Merlin ID app, which lets you identify about the local common birds around your area, doesn't, but doesn't really have too many birds on there. So usually there's the Audubon bird app Sometimes you can also look up all about birds. They can tell you a lot of interesting facts about the birds around us. So Heidi asked, what are you hoping to do next with the Texas Blue Jay Project and your efforts to engage others in birding? Well, I'm so far trying to see if I can get the Texas Blue Jay Project to go beyond the Texas boundaries to teach people around the United States and America about the birds around all over North America, and possibly maybe even the world. We don't know where it holds. Yeah, that's great. Um, Elisa asked, when buying binoculars, what should I look for? How do I buy a good pair? Usually you should go by, like, if the binocular, Usually at the binocular store, they give you at least a chance to try them out in, as a practice. The best binoculars to use, the cheapest set of binoculars would be around $100. But if you want to, usually Vortex binoculars are usually, are personally the binoculars that I like using. They're actually the binoculars I use to go birding. And you can see birds pretty well with them. You can see birds far off in a distance. There's also vortex spotting scopes are pretty good to use birding, for birding as well. And so that's usually the kind of beer, the gear you might want to bring. Um, Christina asked, do you have any recommendations on how to get more kids out on bird walks? I say like, like I say, just try to encourage more kids into outdoor activities where they're going outdoors because in our generation now, a lot of kids, you know, like to stay indoors on the internet and don't really go outdoors too much. So to encourage more kids to just 
put to just not focus too much on the internet and just go out and just explore nature and outdoor activities is usually a great way to get kids outdoors. Thanks. Lawrence wants to know, do you have a favorite bird? Oh yes, it's obviously the blue jay. Blue jays are very magnificent birds. They're my favorite birds because these birds, not only they're very colorful and, and pretty birds to look at, but they actually help out the environment because the blue jays will store acorns and if they don't eat them, they'll bury them underground and they grow into oak trees. And they really do a big part of our ecosystem. And I always like the blue jay's behavior. It's always very flashy and it's always likes to make its appearance well known. And that's actually what gave me the idea to name the Texas Blue Jay Project that. Because I think about the Blue Jays and how they help the environment. Yeah, they're fun birds. Unfortunately, we don't really have them here. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know. But you get the Stellar's Jay, which <laughs> that's a close relative to the Blue Jay, and Scrub Jays. Which, yeah. the, if you come to Texas in the eastern part of the United States, you'll find blue jays. And the stellar jays pretty much looks like a blue jay, but just kind of darker and it has the crest like a blue jay. Nice. And Jan asked, is there a bird you really want to see that's on the top of your to see list? Oh my god, there's so many birds. There's so many birds. Where should I start? Well, because I'm planning to go on a trip to California because there's, in an island, there's actually these tufted puffins. And that's a bird I would really like to see because the tufted puffins are very colorful birds and I like how they have the little spunky hair. Yeah, and I've heard that there's a big rookery over there and that's like one of the birds on my bucket list to see. And there's several birds I would like to see out of state too. A couple of like owls, like especially I want to see the, the little northern pygmy owls. I always think those are very special little owls to find out west. And in Arizona, I'm wanting to try to find the elegant trogon, which is the special bird over there. It would be kind of like their green jay in Arizona, southeast Arizona. It's a very special bird there. Yeah, I've tried to see them before with no luck, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I've heard they're very difficult to find. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, do you backyard bird with feeders? Oh, yes, we do. And actually, as a matter of fact, I kind of did backyard birding a little bit today, as a matter of fact, this morning, because we have a morning dove nest in our back porch. And as I was walking, I saw Cooper's hawk in my backyard. And then there was a little Mel Wilson's warbler in their tree in the backyard. And this is our first yard lifer, our first yard bird of the Wilson's warbler there. Always can't wait to see what special new birds will come to our yard. Nice, yeah, definitely keep an eye out. Um, uh, the next question is, do you think the the painted bunting is present in Houston or do we need to go out in the wild? The painted bunting present in Houston. So usually the painted buntings, they're a wild bird that you can find all over the state of Texas, majority of the state of Texas during the summer. Right now, in, right now there's still a couple of painted buntings around the area, but they're starting to leave soon. So they're gonna head down south. That's where they're going. Um, and the next question is, have any of the authors of the guidebooks you've used had the opportunity to meet you? And if so, which ones? I was able to meet David Allen Sibley at a Rio Grande Valley birding festival one year. I believe I was like 10 or 11 when I met him. He was signing autographs for a bird book and I decided, and I was in line and he wrote an autograph and he actually drew a picture of a blue jay in that bird book. So I thought it was very spe a very special experience for me. Oh, that's so nice. That's awesome that you got to meet him. 
Uh, Jennifer asks, do you have spotting scopes for your project? Yes, we do. We have spotting scopes. Nice. Um, let's see. People are appreciating your loyalty to the Blue Jay. That's great. Um, Harmony asked, do you or have you done nature journaling and would you recommend drawing and noting observations about birds? I usually go out and I write on a notebook. I get like a little pocket-sized notebook and I write down all the birds I see at a particular area. Sometimes look, my mom likes to joke around saying it looks like I'm writing a ticket, but it's actually to keep track of all the birds. Before I used to spell out the full names of the birds, but then I noticed it was too long, so I decided to write the four-letter banding codes for the birds. So like the Blue Jays four letter code would be B-L-J-A if you want to make it shorter and easier. And I'll count how many I saw in the area and I'll write down the time that it was there and also the mileage. And it helps me out when I log in my birds at eBird on eBird as well. It helps me remember them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you do much drawing at all? Oh, yes. I do a lot of bird drawing. Birds are usually fun to draw, especially like the blue jays and all the common backyard birds. They're very fun to draw. Yeah, and that's another great way to learn birds too. Uh, Megan asked, what's the best food to attract birds with? There's several food. Well, usually you can attract them with like sunflower seeds, with suet seeds, and then there's also millet seeds. And if you put cracked corn in your bird feeders, you can also attract a variety of birds too. And if you want to attract like woodpeckers in your yard, you should try to get like what looks like a log and it, which is called a suet feeder. And then you put like peanut butter suet in the feeders and like little nuts in there. And you'll attract like the woodpeckers and in your case, the stellar jays and or scrub jays in your yard. In Austin, we would get the blue jays attracted to those. And usually the millet seeds are for like the smaller birds, like for the chickadees and the sparrows. So yeah, that's those seeds you can attract the bird. And sometimes you can actually make your own homemade feeder with like a little pine cone. Cool, yeah, that'd be a fun home project. Uh, so Antonio says, hey Sebastian, muchas gracias. What bird has been the most challenging or rewarding to see? I don't know. There, like a nemesis bird, there were so many. I remembered a lot of years back, it was very difficult for me to find the pileated woodpecker. I remembered searching all over East Texas and all over the place trying to find this bird, and I couldn't even find it. And everybody keeps saying, oh, it's like, it's very common. You can just find it right there. And I'm like, I tried. I tried, and then not until eventually, when I went to a park in East Texas, it was like a normal community park, there was like a forested area, I was just busy walking, then all of a sudden this big crow-sized bird flew out of the trees and landed, and I'm like, oh my god, that's a pileated woodpecker, and like, finally, and then the funny thing with us about the birds, once you see one, there's so many. And especially like going to East Texas and Huntsville State Park and Tyler State Park, the pileated woodpeckers will just be all over the place, just flying around. And they're so loud that you can hear them from like a distance. I always think they're very special birds. And that has to be my favorite woodpecker is the pileated woodpecker. It's a very special bird. And then there's so many birds, but that's the one I can think of right now that is like a nemesis. Nice. Well, I'm glad you did get to see them. Uh, it is kind of funny how sometimes we look for a bird for a while and we can't see them, and then once you do, suddenly they're everywhere. Um, let's see. Teresa asked, is there a birder that you admire? A uh, birder? I usually kind of admire David Sibley and how he birds and draws the pictures of the birds. I always think it's very, he has a very special way of painting the birds that in his field guide books. And I never really seen anything like his bird field guide books. So I think he's a very special birder. Yeah, they're wonderful. We do have uh, a question that just came in from Marilyn, who asked, uh, how often do you go birding? You, pretty much every day. 
I would go birding. Cause even if it's like raining and we can't go out to a park, I could still bird in my front yard and see the birds in my backyard. So technically I kind of count that as birding a little bit. Yeah, even backyard birding is definitely still birding. Um, <laughs> The next question that just came in is, have you read Kingbird Highway? Oh, no, I haven't read that book yet. Yeah, that might be a good one to pick up. I've heard it's really good. Um, yeah, so uh, there are lots of great um, uh, comments in here. We have um, even a suggestion that uh, you read one of Sibley's new books, What's It Like to Be a Bird? You might like that. Um, yeah. So for everybody, I just want to thank you so much for, for coming and joining us. Um, please feel free to contact us um, and send more questions if you have them. Um, I do want to invite Brian from Latino Outdoors if you want to have it, uh, share any last comments. Uh, sure, yeah. Thank you so much, Sebastian. It's really inspiring to, to hear your journey through birding um, and just the amount of knowledge you have is incredible. It's so amazing. Thank uh, you. you know, I'm hoping that you can inspire um, a lot more youth um, and, you know, like inspire our community too. This is so great. Um, and for anyone uh, who wants to volunteer with Latino Outdoors, uh, we do have a uh, a Google form um, if you want to volunteer here in the Bay Area. Um, I'm going to put it in the in the chat, but uh, we could also send it out in the follow-up email too. I'll go ahead and send that over to you, Serena. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, I'll be sure to include that in our follow-up email tomorrow. And Sebastian, was there, do you have any last comments that you want to share with everyone? Just, just thank you for everyone for attending. It, it's very special to see more people interested in birds. <laughs>